holy, and for that alone we will give him praise. Amen. Hey. Come on and clap your hands. lift our hands right now and just ask God to fill us up let our praises rise and for him to just fill us with him with his presence amen 
Hallelujah. Let praises rise from the inside, from the inside of me. May you delight in the inside, in the inside of me. Come fill my life from the inside, from the inside of me. Set me on fire from the inside, from the inside of me. Cause all I want is for you, you to be glorified, you to be
Well, praise God, saints of God. It is just a blessing to be in this service one more time. Would you open your Bibles with me to the book of John? John chapter 21, and we're going to be looking at verses 15 through 17 of John 21. St. John chapter 21, beginning at verse 15. And the word of God reads, So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my lamb. And he said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to, to just to stand and proclaim your holy word, Lord. And God, we ask God that as we look into your word today, God, that you would reveal truths about your word that, Father, many of us have just looked past. Father, I pray that your word, Father, would take root in our hearts, that you would open our ears and you would open our understanding to your word. My prayer, Father, is that lost lives will be saved today. Lost souls will be drawn unto yourself. But most of all, Father, that your name will be lifted up, that your name will be glorified. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. As we've been studying the Word of God and Jesus' command for us to love one another, to love our neighbor as ourself. And as I was sharing last week, uh, we cannot love our neighbor until we first learn to love ourselves. And for many of us, loving ourselves are difficult at least because many of us, we find ourselves looking back on past choices in our lives bad decisions that we've made, and we just can't seem to let go. But until we're able to love ourselves, to let go of those things that we're holding on to and forgive ourselves, we will never get to the point of being able to love ourselves. And until we can love ourselves, it is impossible to love our neighbor. So I want to speak to you today from the subject of the God of a second chance. For those of you who are still struggling with your past, I want you to know that we serve a God of another chance. And as we look here in John 21, and in and, and this particular area, because it's right after Jesus has uh, risen from the grave. And we know when, when he was arrested and crucified, all the disciples abandoned him and, and they took off for the hills. And, and so here, uh, this, this, this scripture picks up where, where, where Jesus, after he has resurrected from the grave and he, he showed himself uh, to the disciples. Now, you know, so uh, 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 as we look at this text, I want you to keep in mind that we serve a God of another chance. And it's demonstrated very well here in the manner in which Christ deal with Peter after his resurrection. Now, I know that we all have felt at one time or another that we have let someone down. 
I don't think we can go through this life without at some point in life feeling bad about letting someone down. And, 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 and that is far from the best feeling to have. The feeling of having let someone down, that, that's not a very good feeling. Especially, you know, if, if you've boasted about uh, how they could depend on you. You know, you, you can count on me, brother, just, just call out my name and I'll be there. You know, when we've boasted about being there for them, you know, we've boasted about how we can be trusted and how we will never let them down. But you look back and you see that the very thing that you said you would never do, you did it. You let them down. Now to experience this with someone that you love is one thing, but to experience it with the one who laid down his life for you, who died on the cross for you, that can have a much deeper effect. When we look at Peter's life throughout scripture, we see a life that's full of ups and downs. In Matthew 26, 35, we see Peter boasting that he would never deny Jesus. But when Jesus was arrested, the scriptures tell us that Peter watched from a distance. He watched from a distance as Jesus was led away. Peter followed from a distance, close enough, close enough to see Jesus, but not too close to be seen with Jesus. And as Jesus was being tried in the kangaroo courts of the high priest, Peter stood outside and chose to warm himself by the fire. This is the Peter that said, I, the Lord, I'll die with you. And three times he was recognized as a follower of Christ, which gave him three chances to make a bold stance, to take a bold stance and to make a bold statement for his Lord. But all three times, he denied even knowing Christ. In fact, uh, one of the gospel writers said he even cursed at a young girl when she said, you, you're one of them, and, and, and Peter, he cursed. As he said, I do not know him. And, and when the rooster crowed, Jesus had already told Peter that by the time the rooster crow, you will have denied me three times. And when the rooster crowed, scripture said that Peter wept bitterly. Peter cried big time. And I believe that the reason that Peter wept so bitterly was because he saw himself as a total failure, as a total failure. He said, he, he, he said, he said to Jesus, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. He denied him three times though. He said, I would die with you before I deny you. And here we see Peter alive and well, but he denied Christ three times. And, 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 and with this, he, he probably thought that he was permanently disqualified from ever being used by the Lord again. Peter, he probably thought that, you know, ain't no way God can do anything with me after this. Perhaps there is someone here today who can relate to Peter. You may be sitting there and say, I know just how Peter feels. Because, you know, I, I, I've had a similar experience myself. You have sinned and you wandered away from God. And, and, and now you wonder, can God still love me? Can God love me after all I've done? 
Can God love me after the way that I've turned my back on him, after the way I have rejected him? Can God still love me after what I've done? We ask ourselves those questions sometimes. Is there still a place and a purpose for me in God's kingdom? Our text today deals with the time when Jesus appeared to the disciples for the third time after his resurrection. And the Bible say there were together Simon Peter, Thomas, who's called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cyrene and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. You know, he denied Christ and he figured, well, you know, I've blown that, so uh, nothing left to do but go back fishing. That's what I was doing when I met him, so may as well go back fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. You know, you got to be careful, you know, how you're, you have the ability to influence people without even realizing it. Peter felt that he was a failure. And the only thing left for him to do was to go fishing. Now, the other disciples, they didn't just flat out deny Christ. They just took off of the hills. They, they just ran and hid. But, but when Peter, the one that says, you know, Lord, I will die with you. And then when Peter realized that he couldn't live up to that word, he decided that he would go fishing. And the others said to him, Good idea. We're going to go fishing also. After all this time that Jesus spent with them, teaching them about the kingdom, performing miracles in their presence, and they decided that they want to go back to their old life. It's, it's amazing how when we come into the kingdom of God and all of a sudden we hit a rough spot and our tendency and it's, it's encouraged by, by Satan, you know that. Our tendency is to want to go back to what we thought we knew. I know, now back in the world, this is, this is the way I would have dealt this, with this when I was out in the world. Our mind leads us to think that it would be best if I just go back to what I used to do. What I believe he was really saying is the only thing left for me to do is to go back to my previous life. Go back to my previous life. I, I, I have totally failed the Lord. I'm guilty and I cannot be forgiven. You know, there may be someone sitting right here that feel that your sins were so bad that there's no way God can forgive you. I've got news for you. We serve a God of another chance. He, Peter goes off with the weight of guilt hanging heavy on his shoulders as he head out to return to his old life. He probably replayed the tape of his denying, denying the Lord over and over and over again in his mind. How many times have you found yourself rewinding the tape of your past failures? Reliving it over and over and over again in your mind. He, he, he could not forgive himself and maybe he, he wasn't sure if the Lord would even forgive him. You know, we read the scriptures that says if you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you, cleanse you of all unrighteousness. God is not a man that he should lie. If God said it, that sells it. But still, we tend to question whether God can really forgive us for that one. I know God can forgive me for, you know, the little sins. But can he forgive me for the big sins? Let me tell you, the word sin, sin means missing the mark. That, that's the definition of sin. The Bible said we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, we have all missed the mark. Now, whether you missed the mark by 
an inch or whether you missed the mark by a mile. You missed the mark. If you're coming around the curve up in Mount Baldy and you miss that curve by two inches, it's going to be the same as you went directly over the cliff because that two inches of missing that curve is going to take you to the same place, to the bottom of Mount Baldy. So, so the bottom line is there's no such thing as God can forgive me for this one, but there's no way he can forgive me for that one because that's a big sin. Sin is missing the mark. Whether you miss it by an inch or whether you miss it by a mile. You know at times life can be very hard and forgiving yourself is not always as easy as others may think it ought to be. Why are you still worrying about that? You, you know, just, just move on. And, and yes, you should do that. But sometimes there's some, some, some things that need to be fixed before you can move on. There are times in our lives that we face situations that seem almost impossible to overcome. And you can begin, you, be, you begin to punish yourself for that shortcoming over and over again. Now, if that's you, my prayer is that you will be able today to glean from this message something that will help you get past those things that are keeping you in chains to your past. Something that God has for you in the word today, I pray that will break those chains. I like the song, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. Biggest obstacle to forgiving ourselves is often the tendency to wallow in our own self-guilt. But, but what we really need to do is to give it to Jesus. Have a little talk with Jesus and make it right. Jesus had something special for Peter to do. And he wanted Peter to pick himself up, brush himself off, and move on. And that's what God wants you to do today. If you're still wallowing in your past bad choices, your past mistakes, God wants you to pick yourself up, brush yourself off, and move out. You know, when the prodigal son found himself in the pig pen, the Bible said when he came to himself, see, some of us just need to come to ourselves and, 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 and realize that we don't belong in the pig pen of life. We're king's kids. We belong in the palace, not in the pig pen. And the prodigal son, he said, I'm going to get up. Don't miss that part. That's the first step. If you're waddling in self-pity, if you're waddling in past mistakes, the first thing that you need to do is get up. And then he said, I'm going to go to my father. You need to go to God in prayer. Get up. Go to God. And he said, I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned. And I'm not worthy to be called your son. See, that's where the confession part comes in. We get up, turn to God, and confess our sins. And he will forgive you. Not only will he forgive you, but he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Pick yourself up, brush yourself off, and move on down the road. We likewise need to deal with our past in order to experience not only the forgiveness that Jesus brought to us through uh, on the cross, but to understand that we serve a God of another chance. You, you, you notice I say the God of another chance, not a God of a second chance. Because if you're anything like me, you use your second chance up a long time ago. I serve a God of another chance and another chance and another chance. And here, Jesus is going to offer Peter another starting point, another chance to make things right. So after the meal, after a meal together, Jesus 
turn to Peter. You know, as we look earlier in the scriptures, we see that they were out fishing and they caught nothing. Jesus told them, cast the net on the other side and they caught fish. And when they came ashore, Jesus, he already had the, had the, had the fire going, had the fish on the grill. And, and, and they sat down to eat. And so after the meal together, Jesus turned to Peter. And in full view of all the other disciples, Jesus confront Peter. He not, he, he, he's not trying to beat Peter down, but he confronts Peter right in the presence of the other disciples. You know, P Peter wasn't quite sure, uh, you know, wh where he stood now with Christ. You know, I mean, I've denied him. I, you know, I think a whole bunch of things must have been going through Peter's head. And I suspect that he dreaded the thought that Jesus might say something like, Peter, why did you deny me? You know, that's, that's what we expect. Why, why, why did you do that? But no, that, that's, that's not the God that we serve. Jesus had too much compassion to push the knife of guilt any deeper in Peter's heart. Jesus knew how Peter felt. He didn't have to make him feel bad by pouring salt in the wound. He showed Peter compassion. See, and that's what we have to learn to do when those have deceived us, when those who have hurt us, and when all of a sudden we, we have that opportunity to challenge them, to say, I told you so, or, or why did you do that, or to hold it over their heads. But what Jesus did, he didn't hold it over Peter's head. He showed Peter compassion. Loving your neighbor as yourself also includes showing compassion to those who have wronged you, to those who are going through. See, God knew. He, he, he knew what Peter was dealing with. So he didn't lay the guilt trip. He didn't, he didn't shove the knife of guilt deeper into Peter's heart, if you will. But Jesus had too much compassion he had too much compassion for Peter. And the reason is because he is a God of another chance. And his goal was not to add to Peter's pain or add to Peter's guilt. His goal was to remove Peter's guilt. His goal was to remove it. Verse 15 says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, or as some translation, Simon by Jonah, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Now, now notice that Jesus doesn't refer to Simon Peter as Peter. He simply says, Simon. Simon, do you love me more than these? He didn't call him Peter. He called him Simon. And the reason is that the word Peter in the Greek means rock. Remember when he said, I want, you know, when, 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 when he asked the question, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And I said that thou art Peter. When Peter made that confession that Jesus was a Christ, that's when Jesus changed his name from Simon to Peter. Thou art Peter. Thou art the rock, if you will. And the reason that the word the, the, the word Peter in the Greek, it means rock. And, and, and the reason that Jesus didn't call him rock, but called him Simon, because at this point, the title of rock no longer fitted Peter. No, he, he, he wasn't the rock at this point. Peter had, you know, he'd copped out, if you will. So Jesus didn't call him Peter, rock. 
he called him Simon. Because as I said, at this point in Peter's life, he was no longer fit to be called rock, if you will. You see, a rock is strong and above all, it is dependable. And Peter at this point had been anything but dependable. He had not been dependable in this situation. Jesus asked the question. He said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, the these that Jesus is speaking of is not the fish as some have come to believe, but he's speaking of the other disciples. You know, when Peter said, I'm going to go fishing, uh, many take that to, to believe that, well, Peter loved fishing more than he loved Christ. No, Jesus wasn't talking about fishing. When he said, do you love me more than these? He was not talking about the fish. He was talking about the other disciples. He was making a reference to Peter's boast in the upper room where he stated that even though everybody else will forsake you, I never will. Peter in the upper room, he said, all of these might forsake you, but not me. Lord, I'm going to die with you. Peter had been boastful. And what Jesus was asking him was, Simon, are you still willing to make that claim that you made up in the upper room? Are you able to make that claim that you love me more than the rest of these? More than those that might leave me when you say, I will die with you. Peter, do you, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these other disciples? That's, that's really what he's asking Peter. Peter responded. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But this time, there was no comparing himself to the other disciples. There was no boasting. No how his level of commitment was superior to everyone else's. Through this exercise, Peter had learned humility. And he came to realize that maybe he wasn't as strong as he thought he was. Maybe he wasn't as tough as he thought he was. Maybe he wasn't as committed as he thought he was. See, sometimes we act on emotions. We get so emotional. And then when that emotional high come down, we find ourselves faced with the reality. And here we find that same situation with Peter. Peter could never imagine that he could ever deny the Lord. I mean, that was something that Peter couldn't even phantom in his mind of denying the Lord. But he did. You know, I mean, you know, we, we tell the Lord, Lord, I'm, I'm all in. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm with you all the way. But then all of a sudden we find ourselves falling by the wayside. Never imagining that that could ever happen to me. And yeah, I know this happened to other Christians, but I love the Lord and God's been good to me and that could never happen to me. Be careful. Many of us, make the claim that we would never find ourselves in the sin that others commit. But we just don't know. You just don't know. See, that's why we should always be vigilant and on guard. You got to keep your guard up. You know, when, when Satan was tempting Christ in the wilderness, the Bible tells us, Around verse 13, when Satan had used up all his tricks, he departed from him for a season. He left waiting for a better opportunity. So, so if you think that you could never do what somebody else did, 
If you think that I'm strong enough to resist the devil, and that's good, and you should, because the scripture tells us, but our strength don't come from within. It tells us to submit ourselves unto the Lord, and then resist the devil, and we, he will flee. But I want you to know that even though he flee, he's just waiting around the corner. He's just peeping around the corner, waiting for you to have a bad day, waiting for you to go through something and nobody call you and see about you. He's just waiting for all of a sudden you get down in the spirit and that's where he'll show up again. What the Terminator say, I be back. I want you to know that Satan will be back. He'll be back. And that's why we must constantly, we must remain vigilant. Uh, of, uh, <laughs> we must be, remain on our guard to make sure that the enemy don't sneak up on us. It's hard to say vigilant when, you, when your mind's going someplace else, isn't it? David never thought he would commit adultery. You know that? David never thought he would commit adultery. Solomon never thought he would get caught up in idolatry. You know, Simon, he never thought that he would get caught up in it. And Peter never thought that he would deny knowing Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Wherefore let him that thanketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Be careful when you think that you're on top of the world. Be careful. Because when you're on top of the world, you got, a, you got a place you can fall from. Amen. Be careful. In fact, let me tell you something. Right after victory, that's when we're most vulnerable. When, you've, when you have experienced a great success, that's when you're most vulnerable. Why? Because when you experience success or victory, that's when you want to celebrate. That's when you want to enjoy your accomplishment. And that's when you let your guard down. You let your guard down when you've experienced a victory, when you experience success. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 say, be careful, because when you think you stand, that's when you're subject to fall. Peter was overconfident. But Peter learned that he wasn't as strong as he thought he was. And, and, and through this experience, Peter was humble because he became honest about his spiritual condition. Peter became honest about his spiritual condition. Now, as, as most of you already know, the Greek language is said to be a more excellent language than the English language. And, and, and that's why oftentimes, oftentimes it's hard to translate certain passages of scripture as accurately as it should be. It's hard to translate because, because the, the Greek language, you know, it's, it's more explicit than the English language. A good example of this is the exchange between Jesus and Peter here in this text. Here in the text we see in the Greek language, as most of you already know, there are multiple words for the word love. There's eros, which is physical love and, and, and is where, you, where we get our English word erotic from, from the word, Greek word eros. Then there's the kind of love that is known as filio, love, which means brotherly love. And then there's a kind of love that is known as stoke, which is the kind of love that we have for our family members. But the kind of love that the Bible speaks of in many of its, uh, uh, in mainly rather, is the word agape, agape love. And this is the unconditional, 
self-sacrificing love. It means the complete devotion to something. It means to be completely devoted to someone. And here in the text, Jesus says, now, now, now pay close attention here. He says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And the word he uses for love here is the word agape. Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape on me? Agape represents a sacrificial love, a love of total commitment, a love with no strings attached, if you will. In essence, Jesus may have been asking Peter if he would sacrifice all and give himself completely for him. However, notice Peter's response, and, and you know, just reading it from the, from the English Bible, you, you don't see this. And that's why you need to get your Greek Hebrew dictionary and you can look up every word in the Bible and it'll tell you what that word mean in that particular passage. A good $29 strong concordance. You become a Greek scholar overnight. But, but here, you know, Peter's response to Jesus was something different. When we read it, it said, yes, I love you, Lord. Peter responded, Peter replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus asked the question, you love me? Peter go, yes, Lord, you know I love you. But reading that in the English, you really don't see what was really happening there between Peter and Jesus. See, this sounds like a positive, a positive response. However, when describing his love for Jesus, Peter uses a different word than what Jesus used. Peter used the Greek word philio. This Greek word for love means fondness or to have affection for or a personal attachment or friendship. So Jesus asked Peter, do you love me unconditionally? And Peter's response basically was, yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend. That's basically what he said. Do you love me? Do you agape on me? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. Lord, you know I'm your friend. See, yet even with this response, even with this response, the Lord says to Peter, feed my lamb. Feed my lamb. Then Jesus asked Peter a second time, Peter, do you agape me? Peter responded, you know, Lord, that I filio you. Peter, do you love me unconditionally? You know, Lord, that I'm your friend. See, you don't see that when you read that in English. Jesus says, okay, friend, <laughs> tend my sheep. Third time. Jesus changes the word and he asked Peter, do you filio me? And Peter responded, Lord, you know everything. You know that I filio you. Lord, you know I'm your friend. Now, now why did Jesus continue to ask Peter these questions? I believe that Jesus wanted Peter to really look at himself and realize the level of commitment that he was able to make to Christ. Not the level he wanted to make, but the level that he was able. See, sometimes we're not able to serve God at the level of commitment that we want to do it. And, and here we find God uses Jesus as he continued to challenge Peter. He helped Peter to even realize that he was not able to serve the Lord at the level that he thought he could. What we see here is God's grace in action. He didn't 
criticize Peter because Peter couldn't say, I agape, oh, you love. He, 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 he just showed his grace towards Peter. We see the God of another chance showering his grace upon Peter. Jesus is graciously meeting Peter at his level of ability to respond. He realized that Peter couldn't love him unconditionally. Peter wasn't there yet. And Jesus didn't reject him because he wasn't there yet. But what he did was he met Peter at his level of ability to respond. See, our loved ones may not always be able to live up to our expectations. And just like God showed grace to Peter, we need to shower grace upon those who cannot live up to our expectations. And we need to meet them at their level of ability and walk with them to their greatest potential. Jesus is graciously meeting Peter at his level of ability to respond. Peter was simply being honest here. He realized that he wasn't quite at the agape level yet. I ain't there yet, Lord. See, some of us that's got to come to the realization, I don't care how long I've been in church, Lord, I'm still a work in progress. I'm not there yet, Lord. So my question to you is, how honest are you about your spiritual condition? How honest are you about your spiritual condition? See, Jesus know how we love him. You know, it may be filio, it may be agape, or it may be in the process of transforming to agape. As, as, as we are being transformed into the image of Christ. And just like with Peter, Jesus wants us to receive and experience total forgiveness for our transgressions as well. True forgiveness and joy is found only when we allow Jesus to work in our lives and, and, and when we allow him to be Lord of every aspect of our life. See, you can't invite Christ into the house and say, okay, Lord, come on in, but you got to stay right there in the living room. You know, I don't let nobody in my kitchen and don't even think about going to my bedroom. Since I haven't cleaned the bathroom yet, uh, I'm sorry, you can't use that either. I want you to know if Jesus is not Lord of all, he will not be Lord at all. He wants you to hit the stop button, get off the guilt merry-go-round and stop replaying your past over and over again. He want to be Lord of every aspect of your life. See, Peter could not go back and undo the statements that he had made. He, he, you can't unring a bell. You can't unscramble an egg. He couldn't go back and undo what he had said. He couldn't go back and change his impulsive actions, if you will, or undo the three times that he had denied Christ. He couldn't undo that. But the God of another chance was saying, Peter, you have been recommissioned. So put the past behind you because there is work to be done. And I can still use you, Peter. See, some of you believe that, you know, I've just messed up. God can't use me. God can still use you, Peter. God can still use you, Mary, Margaret, Jane, whoever you are. God can still use you. Put the past behind you. Jesus wants to recommission each and every one of us to be used as his disciples. He wants to show his grace and, 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 and for you to share his joy with everyone that he placed in your path. God placed people in your path that you might be a witness for him. But if the first thing they see is a frown, I don't know if that's 
a very welcoming invitation to the kingdom. He wants to show his grace and for you to share his joy with everyone that he placed in your path. In closing, I want to leave you with three things to think about. And the first is, no matter how gross your past may be, Jesus, the God of another chance, is not only ready to forgive you, but he also wants to restore you. He's not only ready to forgive you, but he wants to restore you to your rightful position in the kingdom. You need to believe that Jesus can restore you and use you no matter how much you've messed up. You need to believe that he can use you for his glory. You know, I, I've talked to people, I see people now that I talk to uh, throughout the years and, 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 and how they've allowed God to use them in situations that they never dreamed that they could be used in. No matter how bad it is, I want you to know God can use you to his glory. Some of the most powerful preachers to ever preach the gospel have at one time been named among some of the worst sinners, but God washed them and he restored them. Even if you see yourself as a bona fide failure, Jesus is ready to restore you and he wanna use you for great things for his kingdom. Second, if you wanna be restored, then you must be honest about your spiritual condition. Stop faking it. You know, people say, fake it till you make it. No, when it comes to the Lord, stop faking it. You know, the first thing you do when you come into the presence of the Lord is surrender. You, you, you Lord, I can't do it. But your word tell me that I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Stop faking it. You're not there yet. You're a work in progress. Be honest about your spiritual condition. Lord know you struggle. You don't have to tell the whole world that you're struggling, but you know it's good to have an accountability partner that you can sit and kind of talk, talk with and talk through some things. You know, people I've seen people tore from the floor. Brother, how you doing? Oh, brother, I'm blessed and I'm highly favored. And deep down inside, you're dying. You know, sometimes you just need to say, Man, I'm going through right now. You know, right now, I, I'm, I'm, man, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just discouraged. Uh, you know, man, sometimes I, I'm not sure whether I'm saved. Those are real, these are real things that we as Christians experience. And I'm not just talking about you that's sitting in the pews. Because sometimes in the pulpit, we go through some of those same challenges. See, the enemy is not a respect of person. And if you, if, if, if you set that idle enough, he will plant a thought in your mind. My mama used to have a saying that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And I finally understood what she mean. Because I want you to know that anytime the devil finds an empty head, he's going to find something to put in it. And we need to be, so we need to be honest about our spiritual condition. You don't have to go around wearing a sign or waving a flag. But you know where you are. And sometimes rather than saying, I'm blessed because everybody else is blessed, you need to sometimes say, you know, and a lot of you may even shock someone. How you doing, brother? Man, I'm going through a whole oh, oh, Okay, I'll talk to you later. You know, some people really don't want to know how you're doing. That, that's just a, an expression. How you doing? You know, and yeah, you go, I'm hurt. No oh, good. I'll see you later. But no, you need to be honest about your spiritual condition. Some of you are not fine in your faith. You lack commitment to Christ and to the body of Christ. So the thing you need to do is to admit that your relationship with Christ is not what it should be. And then allow Christ to bring you to the point where you need to be. See, you'll never fix a problem until you acknowledge that the problem exists. 
That's why I say, mothers, if God bless you, if you got a child on drugs, don't, don't, don't be denying that he's on drugs. Because see, you won't pray for him if you, if you won't acknowledge the fact that he's on drugs. If you don't want to believe that your child's in a gang, you're not going to pray him out of the gang because you don't believe that he's in the gang. Be honest with your spiritual condition. Don't say you're fine if you're not fine. You know, I mean, hey, we all go through. You lack commitment to Christ and to the body when you're not true about your spiritual condition. So, thing you need to do is to admit that your relationship is not what it needs to be with Christ. Then allow Christ to fix it. And third, realize that when you're honest with God, then God will be honest with you. Jesus said, if you will confess your sins, he will be faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. See, the God that we serve is a God of another chance. So no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how many chances you have squandered in the past, God will still offer you another chance. Let's pray. Father, we bless your name. We thank you, Lord, that you are God of another chance. God, many of us have give up, given up on ourselves, but we thank you, Lord, that you never give up on us. And God, even though we may wander away from you, Lord, it's easy for us to find you. Because God, you're right there where we left you. Well, no matter how far we wander, whenever we want to find you, all we have to do is just return to the spot where we left you. And Lord, you're always right there waiting to receive us unto yourself. Some of us need to come to ourselves just like the prodigal son. We need to get up, brush ourselves off, Go to our Father and confess, Father, I've sinned, fallen short of your glory. I'm not worthy of your grace. I'm not worthy of your love. But God, we thank you that you look beyond our faults and you meet us at our point of need. We thank you that you're God of another chance. So I pray, Father, for any who are listening today. God, if they're still waddling in self-pity, if they're still chained to guilt, Lord, I pray, God, that they would lay those things at the foot of the cross. Confess, Father, because you promised that you would be faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And they may pick themselves up, brush themselves off, and move forward to being productive members of the kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, saints of God. I pray that God's word today encourage you uh, as we are going through this whole series of loving one another. You can't get there until you start right at home. Until you get yourself together, you can never obey God's command to love your neighbor because you really don't love yourself. And the reason that many of us don't love ourselves because we haven't forgiven ourselves or we are still listening to a tape that somebody else recorded about us. We need to start reading the Word of God and we need to line up what God says about us because over in Psalms 139, he said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I pray today that if God spoke to your heart and you decided that you're going to make a commitment to the Lord, that you want to give your life to the Lord, you want to become a Christian, you want to return from being backslidden, Right there on the screen, there's some information. There's a number that you can call. Give us a call. We want to hear from you, and we'll get back with you, tell you what the next step that you need to do. Thank you for tuning in. Right now, we want to prepare to receive the offering. We want to pray God's blessing over your gift. Right there on the screen, there's information on how you can give to the work of the ministry. So we want to pray right now. We want to thank God for your contribution to spread in this gospel message beyond these walls and around the world. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, first of all, for your word, Lord. Thank you, God, that 
you have reminded us through your word that you are not a God who hold grudges, but you're a God of another chance. And Lord, as we now prepare to give, Father, to the work of the ministry, my prayer is that we would give with understanding, Lord, realizing that our gifts, Lord, go to help get this gospel message out around the world, Father. And Father, I pray that we would give with the attitude that you speak of in your word. You say that every man as he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, because you love a cheerful giver. So God, I pray that whatever it is that we give, Lord, that we give it cheerfully, because God, we know that that is what you require in order to receive our gifts, is that it's given from the heart and that it's given cheerfully. Now I ask that you would receive the gifts, multiply the gifts many times over and return it back to the giver. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in again this week. And we wanna ask you that, you know, we're going through some challenging times in our country right now. And you know, hatred is just running rampant. And we've all, all of a sudden, we're lining up on this side or that side, on the left or on the right, on the Democrats, on the Republicans. We need to line up on God's side because God's not pleased with any of us as we just constantly debate uh, the issues of what's going on in our country as our babies are being killed and our, our loved ones are being killed as they do something as simple as go to the supermarket. Church, it's time for us to pray. It's time to put these labels and, and all of this desire for power aside. And we need to come together as God's children and pray for this country. Because until we pray for it, we are turning it over to Satan. Satan's not going to pray for things to get better. God's people, the world is not going to pray for things to get better. They're going to pray for the things that they want, the things that's going to make them prosper. But we as God's children, we need to be Christians first. And we need to pray for America, not only for America, but pray for the world. Because God is not just the God of America, he's God of the world. So we need to pray for what's going on in, in, in our country. We need to pray for what's going on in Ukraine. We need to pray for what's happening around the world. And God will honor your prayers. So until the next time, stay prayed up, stay safe, and God bless you. Until the next time.